Hello and welcome. I'm Tomasa Ridan and this is Story Scanner, the stories everybody's talking about in a way nobody is. A podcast based on the stories headlining Via Sarfati 25, the magazine from Bocconi University, with analysis and insight from Bocconi professors and researchers on the big topics in business, management, data science and politics. In this episode, we take a look at something that shapes all of our lives, networks. Networks consist of the web of relationships formed by people in order to get things done. This web supports the many functions that people fulfill in life and at work, from taking decisions to socializing, innovating, planning, learning and developing their careers, influencing our successes and failures. Jacob Moreno is credited with developing the first sociograms in the 1930s to study interpersonal relationships, and these approaches were formalized and developed starting in the 1950s, whilst theories and methods of social networks became pervasive starting in the 1980s. So that relationships matter, and the relationship networks often explain more than skills and ideas, has been known for a long time. Research on social networks has highlighted how relationships impact health, happiness, work attitudes and consumer behaviour, and that to fully understand the power of these networks in which we are immersed, we cannot imagine them as a simple set of relationships, but rather as a complex system with specific properties. These phenomena appear increasingly relevant due to the exponential growth of interconnections between systems, societies and economies. Social and competitive processes occur in an increasingly small world, where the degrees of separation between people and social actors are reduced, and ideas spread with a speed and scale unthinkable only a few years ago. Whilst in popular culture the theory of six degrees of separation abounds, the most recent research so that shows that 4.7 connections are sufficient for anyone on Facebook to reach anyone else on the network whilst the average degree of separation is as low as 3.57. Giuseppe Soda, Dean of Zabocconi School of Management, studies network theory and can tell us more about the power of networks. Network is a perspective. It is a way, very powerful from an analytical standpoint, to look and understand the complexity and the functionings of groups, organizations, institutions in which we spend our life. Network thinking allows us scientifically understand the world around us as one of connections that shaped observed phenomena, rather than as one where the intrinsic properties of people determine outcomes. Networks are fundamentally powerful because knowledge, information, behaviors, ideas, opinions, beliefs, values, and attitudes are largely shaped by the nature and the structure of the relations connecting individuals. This way to visualize, study, and understand is a scientific revolution. The network revolution reshapes our basic common sense expectations of the world around us and may allow us to recognize that we are not the basically individualistic, asocial, and quarrelsome creator that comes in banded linguistic, ethnic, racial, or religious types, but a social species linked to one another by far-reaching network ties. From the point of view of companies called to interpret the reality of networks in order to assume effective decisions, it appears evidence that in today's world, it is necessary to equip themselves with instruments, advanced knowledge, and to modify some fundamentals of management. The science of networks can provide them with analytical and conceptual tools that open up an extraordinary space for understanding complex systems, such as economies, markets, and companies. Professor Soda gives us some insight into the relevance of network theory to the business world. Let's imagine that the gene of the lamp gives us a pair of magic glasses that allows us to see the informal web of relationships and connections among individuals that take place in any company or organizations. Hundreds of pipes linking people, thanks to which they can get information, they can exchange knowledge, idea, 
opinions. For example, the magic glasses help us to visualize what's happening every minute in the research and development department of a firm working in the pharmaceutical industry. We see some dots that are the employees of the company, and we see connections or ties that represent the informal connections through which these people exchange knowledge and information and also help each other in getting things done. Furthermore, the connections we see are also crucial to get emotional and psychological support and also to share emotions and affects. Now, we know that the structure of this network affects the productivity of this R&D department. For instance, the number of new products developed or the patents granted by individuals and the organization as a whole. Broadly speaking, we know that the structure of the connections with others influence us. What we do, the decisions we make, our behaviors, our orientations, our attitudes, even our health, our happiness, our identity. Moreover, these networks are also very powerful influencing some outcomes, such as our performance, our individual creativity, our career, and also outcomes at the organizational level. Whilst the general applicability of network mechanisms and their usefulness as a tool to understand the business world is well established in the West, there are only in recent years been serious network research shifting geographic focus to the East. Sonia Oppa, an institutions and global strategy professor at Bocconi, an expert in business management in China, has delved into networks in her research work. She gives us her thoughts on whether the general mechanisms described by Professor Soda are general or culturally contingent observations. Knowing about and trained in network mechanisms is a manager to any advantage in a different cultural context, such as China? Well, the short answer is yes. The general association between network structure and performance, or more specifically, between open social structures and creativity, innovation and economic performance, is as much in place in China as in the West. This is in contrast to long-held beliefs that social networks are culturally unique and always context-specific. However, we've learned over the last 30 years of research that network mechanisms are universal, which means a manager or entrepreneur with an open network enjoys an advantage, whether this manager operates in Milan, New York, or Shanghai. The cultural difference is not found in the network mechanism, but in the staffing of the social network. Here, the local institutional and cultural environment can play quite a significant role. Let me give you an example. An entrepreneur or manager operating a new firm in China, possibly in one of the country's sunrise industries receiving lots of political attention, is unlikely to be successful without the right connections with local administration and political decision makers. Our manager could survive possibly even do well, but is not likely to become a local leader. So our manager will be wise to connect with the right people. The same manager in a startup situation in New York would be less concerned about having political friends and decision makers in the administration. This manager's primary concern would have to be to have access to the right venture capital firms and to recruit the best talent. Politics is not a concern. However, in spite of different network staffing, reflecting the very different institutional and market environments, both managers will need open networks if they want to be sure to come across the right information and business opportunities. In one of her recent works, Professor Oppa looked at how behavior is associated with distinct network styles specifically analyzing the effects of CEOs' social networks in terms of breadth and quality on business strategy. She tells us more. Well, the association between social networks and performance outcomes is already well established by past research. 
Right now, we see more and more research describing how specific network structures also correlate with certain behavioral preferences and dispositions, and as a consequence, with managerial styles and business strategies. In my last study, jointly conducted with Ronald Burt, we explore how closed networks affect time horizon in strategic planning. We studied data from a representative sample of 700 managers in China. We find that managers surrounded by closed networks tend to develop myopic tendencies. Managers surrounded by closed networks lack information diversity and variable opinion. So these managers begin to interpret the future as nothing but an endless replication of the status quo. They begin to feel safe and as a consequence, neglect the future. Short-term thinking begins to replace long-term strategies. We found that these managers even neglect the development of their employees. The correlation between network structure and planning preferences is unlikely to be the only behavioral correlate of distinct network styles. We're only beginning to understand the different ways that certain social structures around us shape the way we respond and behave. In a parallel study, for instance, we found that managers surrounded by closed networks also tend to become less cooperative in transactions with colleagues beyond their network. So in short, the networks in which we are embedded in do not just predict access to information and opportunities, they actually also shape who we are and how we perceive the world around us. Managers must also know how to coordinate and drive networks of teams and individuals so as to best create competitive success and innovation. In one of his recent studies, Professor Soda analyzed the collaboration models of the over 200 artists who have worked on 273 episodes of the Doctor Who TV series, discovering that disruption and diversity drive creativity. He tells us more. With Ron Burt and Pier Vittorio Manucci, we studied the creativity of Doctor Who, the longest-running science fiction television show as it has been in production since 1963. We tried to understand what distinguishes teams that can produce highly creative products. For the entire history of the TV, TV show, we studied the network of collaborations among creative roles, screenwriters, directors, producers. We compare creative people embedded in open or closed networks and check whether their network can predict the creativity they've been able to generate over the years. Results are very interesting. Creativity diminishes when closeness increases, so the more open is the network, the higher the creativity. The more closed is the network, the lower the creativity. There are two mechanisms that explain this finding. Creative people who have access to non-redundant ideas, perspectives, and frames are more likely to engage in divergent thinking and remote association and, consequently, creativity. Creators whose network structures are open enjoy advantages because they are more likely to be exposed to variations that in turn lead to creative outcomes. These effects are amplified if creators are able to change over time the people with whom they collaborate. So the network should be open and unstable. I hope you enjoyed hearing more about networks and how they impact on our lives, how we behave, work and socialize. You can read more about networks in the new issue of Vyasar Fatih 25 magazine with opinion, research and insights from Bocconi professors and researchers. Università Bocconi Editore has also just published the Italian edition of Marissa King's Social Chemistry, in which the professor of the Yale School of Management, based on the insights of neuroscience, psychology and the science of networks, discusses how we can all build more meaningful and productive relationships. While it is commonly believed that what counts is the size of the network of contacts, she highlights how social science research has discovered that what is at stake is the quality and structure of our connections. 
I'm Tomasa Ridani, and I hope you'll join me again for the next episode of Story Scanner. <laughs>